Welcome to Catholic Answers Live, the program where you participate with your questions about apologetics and evangelization, including the most important theological, spiritual, moral, and social issues facing the world today. Call now with your question for today's guest. Toll free, 1-888-31-TRUTH. That's 888-318-7884. Now, from San Diego, Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back, and thanks for being with us in this last hour of the week here on Catholic Answers Live. I am Cy Kellett, your host. Our topic this hour, does science need Christ? Modern science had plenty of opportunities to come into being, whether in maybe Confucian China or Hindu India, whether in the highly rational ancient Greece or Rome, or even in the very advanced societies of medieval Islam, but it did not arise in any of those times or places. It rose only from the culture of medieval Catholicism, why is this? Could it be that Christ himself is the missing ingredient that made the leap into modern science possible? If you have questions about the real relationship, the true relationship between science and the Christian faith and the person of Christ himself, we welcome your calls this hour. 888-318-7884 is the number. 888-318-7884. Maybe that's a little controversial what I said. I hope it is. We'd be happy to take your call. Our guest this hour is Stacy Trasankos. Dr. Trasankos earned a bachelor's degree in science from East Texas State University, a doctorate in chemistry from Penn State University, and a master's degree in dogmatic theology from the Holy Apostles College and Seminary. She's the adjunct professor, uh, or she is an adjunct professor at Seton Hall University and at Holy Apostles, where she also serves as the Alumni Association president. Dr. Trasankos is the author of Science Was Born of Christianity, <laughs> the teaching of Dr. Oh, excuse me, of Father Stanley J. Locke, and she's the author most recently of uh, Particles of Faith, a Catholic Guide to Navigating Science, which my, I would like to recommend very highly to you. This is a fantastic book on Catholic faith and science, and she and her husband, Jose, have seven children and three grandchildren and live in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. Dr. Stacy Trasankos, thank you for being with us today. Hello, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, you are with us via video as well. People can see you if and see our conversation on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or Periscope if they like, but I can't see it. I don't know what something happened <laughs> to the monitor, so I can't see you, Dr. Trasankos, right now. Um, did I go too far in, in suggesting that, uh, that uh, medieval Christianity was the only uh, place where uh, modern science was able to get a start? No, I don't think you went too far, and I'm so happy that that message is starting to be repeated more and more. Um, there's, you can put it as a strong claim or a weaker claim, a strong claim that it could only have been born in a Christian culture, um, or you could say a weaker claim that it was born in a Christian culture and not any other. And certainly the weak claim um, is very, it's a fact. Um, modern science rose in the Christian West, and some people might say that that was just a coincidence, but it most certainly was not a coincidence. It was a very direct consequence of the world view that the world has a beginning in time and that it is created by a creator who um, instilled the laws of physics that we learned about. And so the, the Christian mindset was, wow, this is creation. Let's go study it and see what how God made it. And that that view is unique to Christianity, to a um, incarnational and Trinitarian Christian worldview that no other religion has. So you can say that it was born in, of Christianity. Well, now you're a trained scientist. Do you, did you get your scientific training before you got your uh, divinity training? Um, yes. Okay, so when, in the world of science, do you think scientists know this history of science, or are, is it irrelevant? It's like, for example, you, you, be, you have a PhD in in chemistry. There's no real necessity as a PhD in chemistry that you know the history of science and how it got to the point it's at now. No, there's no real reason to. Um, I mean, you, a, a scientist can very well get up and put on the lab coat and go do his or her work just fine without even having faith and without even knowing the history. But it's a personal thing. It's, it's at some point, if you love science, at some point you are going to ask the biggest question of all, where did all of this come from? I mean, why do electrons do what they do? Like, who did that? And you don't have an answer without faith. So uh, you worked at DuPont. You worked at the, yeah. the big DuPont Corporation doing chemistry there. 
Yeah. And and so at some point that question occurred to you. You thought it did. And and that's what sent you towards getting your degree in divinity. That, there's a lot that happened in between there and a lot of good things I owe to my dear husband um, who put up with me. But um, it actually started before DuPont. It started when I was in graduate school. My research project for my doctoral thesis was artificial photosynthesis. And uh, let me tell you something, you've never felt humbler in your life than when you try to simulate what those mindless flapping leaves do every day out in the sunshine. When you try to replicate that in a laboratory because you're trying to do something good for humanity, you're trying to um, harness energy in a responsible way, and you can't even do a fraction of it, you suddenly, it hits you over the head. Where did all that come from? Like, how did the, how come the leaves do that? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in a certain way, I kind of have the feeling, I, I, I want to test this idea out on you because you actually know the answer to these things, but the, you, I have the sense that with the, the rise of the new atheists over the last decade or two and this pushing of a certain view of science in opposition to religion, it's actually good that they raised a lot of the questions they did because their history was wrong. I think this, the, their, their extrapolations from science on a philosophical level were wrong, mm -hmm. but there are answers to these things. So it's good to ask the question, well, where did science come from? And, and, and how, did, how did we get all this modern science that we have? It, it wasn't a reaction against religion. It was, it was fostered in a religious environment. Absolutely. And I encounter this all the time because the textbooks I teach from at the college and the high school level both are secular textbooks and they all kind of start with Galileo, which always gets a nose wrinkle towards the Catholic Church. And they start with Galileo, but the story goes back. Galileo had his views because he was Catholic. He had his views about why does the world act, the, you know, why does nature do what it does? And he was curious about it because he was born into a culture that already saw things that way. I mean, he asked some brilliant questions, but he was, he was part of a longer tradition that came before him back to St. Thomas Aquinas and um, Father Yaki's work, who I study, he's written a book that's just been republished, um, Science and Creation. And he details it back, not just back to um, St. Thomas Aquinas in the medieval times, he details this mindset, this worldview that is unique among any other culture or religion. He did details it back to early Christianity and even to the biblical times. And it's there. If you open up the Old Testament and read it, you'll see what he's talking about, this naturalistic view of the world that God created everything. And that's where it came from. And... And so when we uh, think about the, the roots of science in this medieval period, it's not just an accident, but the, those people actually created a network of universities, like the medieval universities. Right. They created a network of hospitals, something the world had never seen before. This is not like, oops, science just got going here in this Christian place. It's because of this entire Christian culture that formed that science was able to get going. It was, and that's why I like Father Yaki's analogy that it was born of Christianity, because as any mother knows, you don't just go, boom, there's a baby. I did it all by myself. <laughs> you, um, It takes some time, and it takes some development, and it takes the help from other people. So that's one thing that Father Yaki does, too, which you don't expect to hear me say or him to say when you say science was born of Christianity, it also was nurtured in by other cultures. Like there were scientific advances in other cultures and he fully acknowledges all of those. But those other cultures, it, it's even sadder sometimes because of that. They had the skill and the ingenuity and they had the longing and the questions, but their, their, their um, dogmatic adherence to pantheism, which is opposite of creationism, kept them from going that extra step to developing science as a sustainable, viable discipline that became universal and that changed the world like it did um, after it rose in, in the medieval West. And Okay, so now what about, we get to the point now we have modern science and we have all that, but there's a way in which there's a certain, there's another temptation not the one that says, oh, there's only just the material world and all you, all you religious people, you have this fantasy and all that. But there's this other thing that happens too where people now 
And I, I spoke about that. We did a, you and I did a long extended interview for Catholic Answers Focus, but I used the person of Deepak Chopra as the example of this. <laughs> and I don't mean to pick on Dr. Chopra, but this <laughs> idea that it's, that's, that says, well, it's all spirit. You know, the whole thing is spirit. There's, you know, it's not, it's the opposite of the materialist view. It's a super hyper spiritualist view that says, you know, at, at the root of all of it, it's spirit. And that's also inimical to science, that view, isn't it? Right. Yes, it is. And it, if you um, study the history that Father Yaki is talking about in his book about why the other religions in their pantheism, why they were not able to have the cultural psychology to ask the questions that started modern science, it's because of that. It's because of the spirit thing that you just said. Um, what pantheism does, and, and there are all different forms of it, and I know I'm generalizing, but it it teaches that there is an eternally cycling cosmos, that whatever cycle you're born into, you're just born into that part of the cycle. There's nothing you can do about it. There's a resignation to you are born in the time when you're born and, and you can't progress or change. It's not a linear time. It's a cyclical time. And that also that all those religions taught, and if you look, and he, he quotes and cites their hymns and things, they taught a rejection of the world and an adherence to things away from the world, to things either inside your spirit, to unite your spirit with the universal spirit, um, or to seek the things of within the self. But it was all turning away from you know, picking up a rock and seeing how fast it falls to the ground. It was all the di different direction of that. Yep. And I, and I think if you, if you do that now, so when people say things like that now, they don't realize that they're going the wrong way. So we've made all these scientific progresses now, but if to turn in that direction, it, you know, he can say that all his life, fine, but it's the wrong direction to be going. It's the wrong questions to be asking. 888-318-7884 is our number. You're listening to Catholic Answers Live. And our topic today, does science need Christ? We intend that to be a little bit of a provocative topic, and we welcome your calls. I'll tell you this. If you only get one book on the relationship between faith and science, I hope you will get Dr. Trisankos's book, Particles of Faith. Very new, new book. Um, out, and I, it, it's, it's just a magnificent book. And today we're giving you the opportunity to talk to the author. If you've got a challenge for her, I, I strongly believe Dr. Trisankos is up to the challenge. 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kellett. We'll be right back. Stay with us for more Catholic Answers Live. This is Tim Staples, and I'm challenging you to take the 20 Answers Challenge. Catholic Answers 20 Answers series offers hard facts, powerful arguments, and clear explanations of the most important topics facing the church and the world. Here's how the challenge works. When you purchase the sampler of all 20 books in the series, we're gonna knock the price in half, and we're challenging you to finish them all this Lent and Easter season. Then we're gonna take $10 from each set purchased and provide materials to our friends at St. Paul Street Evangelization so they can do what they do best, hit the streets and share the Catholic faith. That's $10 from every set you purchase going to help our fellow workers in the vineyard. You win, St. Paul Street Evangelization wins, the Catholic Church wins, that's a win-win-win. Together, we can be part of something great. Call 888 or visit the shop at catholic.com now to get your set and begin taking the 20 Answers Challenge today. Catholic Answers Live is brought to you in part by CatholicSingles.com, the website for Catholics who want to meet others who share their faith and values for faith, fellowship, and love. You can learn more at CatholicSingles.com. Catholic Answers Live thanks CatholicSingles.com for their generous support. How do we know there's an afterlife? Should we pray to saints in heaven? Is reincarnation possible? In 20 Answers, Death and Judgment, You'll find smart, solid answers to these questions and many more. Looking at the last things that await us, including purgatory, heaven and hell, and the resurrection of our body, as well as the end times and the renewal of all creation. 20 Answers, Death and Judgment is part of the 20 Answers series from Catholic Answers, offering hard facts, powerful arguments, and clear explanations of the most important topics facing the church and the world all in a compact, easy-to-read package. Visit shop.catholic.com today and take a look at this exciting new series from Catholic Answers Press. 
Call now with your question. 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. Does science need Christ? That is our topic this hour. We are very privileged to have Dr. Stacy Trisankos, the author of Particles of Faith, and a prolific uh, writer online as well. We can find your blogging, isn't that? Where can we find your blogging? I guess that's the way I should have said that. Where can we find your blogging? Well, I used to write. I used to write on StacyTrasenkos.com, but I, it's fallen off since I've started teaching. So usually at National Catholic Register, that's the place I publish the most now. It oh, that's right. You have a regular. It's a regular column there at National Catholic Register. It's yeah. It's supposed to be, but I'm teaching like ten classes this semester online, <laughs> right here. I never leave my house, but I'm very busy. <laughs> so mother of seven and online teacher at the Colby Academy. Is, do I have that right? Is it the Colby? Yes. Academy? So, yes. Come on, get on it. You, you need to do one more thing, Stacey. I know. You need to have <laughs> get that column to be regular. All right, so our topic, uh, Does Science Need Christ? Uh, Dr. Trisenkos is in a particularly uh, uh, advantageous position to address this question as a trained scientist herself, a PhD and former DuPont um, uh, chemist, and also as uh, someone with a master's degree in divinity. And uh, we'll go, is it okay with you, Dr. Trisenkos, if we go right to calls? Sure. We go yes. then to Victor in Winston-Salem, North, Cal uh, North uh, Carolina, watching on YouTube. I was going to say we're going to calls, but watching on YouTube. But this is a call, Nick, right? Okay, so Win uh, Victor, you are on with Dr. Tosankos. What's your question? Thanks for taking my call. So um, I know that with, uh, with a lot of atheists and with some Christians, they separate uh, uh, science and religion. And like, for instance, with my wife, she's strongly against uh, evolution. And with me, I don't have a problem with evolution, but come to a point where I can't really talk to her about it. Uh, my question is, is it, um, is it to the point where people have an inaccurate view of God? They think of God so small or put him in the box, they think that uh, God won't allow things like evolution or the Big Bang. Um, yes, and I, I sympathize very much with your position there, um, and I think you're wise just to kind of let it go and love your wife and um, let her find her own way there. But yes, you. But things like it, it's you're exactly right. It's just thinking of God as too small, and that's something we do, I think, as humans, because sometimes we just can't believe it. We just can't get there and 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 think about it. But as, as far as evolution goes, like. People heart, this actually breaks my heart a little bit. People have been taught for a long time that there is evolution and then there is everything you learn in catechism class and that the two are t so totally separate. And if you believe evolution, you're turning your back on your faith. And I actually respect people who care so much about their faith that they won't even do that because you can get through life without knowing evolution and you'll be fine. But the, the question then to challenge there, it's okay, because God created everything. God created the heaven and the earth. He made you and me and everything, and if things evolve, if living bodies evolved over time, then God created them to do that. There's nothing to ever worry about. I mean, scientists are going to go out and roll up their sleeves and discover what they can discover and come up with theories, and theories are going to be amended, and new discoveries are going to be made, and science is going to keep going, and science has been wrong a million times before, but there's no problem believing that bodies evolved over time. We can never deny the soul, but there's no problem at all in wondering how from non-living matter did the first living thing arise and then how did human beings arise over all those years how did the diversity of life arise if anything you just go wow like like wow like like how did this happen how did god do all of this and you can spend your life asking that question and it is very big but fundamentally i mean we're made of atoms life came from atoms we don't have to worry about denying our faith to believe that just pray the first line of the creed and mean it <laughs> Thank you very much for that, uh, Victor. We appreciate that call. We'll go Thank to you, Victor. Anita. All, well, we're getting a lot of calls from YouTube. We must be very popular on YouTube Live now. Uh, <laughs> Anita in Plymouth, uh, Michigan, listening or watching on YouTube, your question for Dr. Stacy Trasankos. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. My question is, how can science and religion coexist. I can't reconcile that in my mind at all. 
to me, science is based on the scientific method. It goes back way back to Egyptian, uh, ancient Egyptian times. They didn't have Christ. They had numerous gods. And they were very brilliant with science, math, medicine. There was some Christ involved. So why, why and how should I, why should I reconcile these two? Um, what is the point? Um, scientific methods is data, black and white. Religion is theology, philosophy, and based on belief, personal, individual, variable belief. And how, how and why should I reconcile these two? Well, thank you so much for calling in and asking that question. I think it takes a lot of courage to even say that and ask someone that. Um, and I'll tell you how, how I reconciled it because I've been where you are, Anita. Um, and how I reconciled it was I, I spent a long time, like into my 30s, not caring about much of anything but the scientific method. And and it's a brilliant method to find out about nature and how, how atoms and molecules, in my case, and physics and, and how all of those things fit together. But at some point, I wanted to know more. Like at some point, I thought, you know, my children were getting older. I had this longing to love and be loved and to fit in. And at some point, I'm like, this science is starting to seem really dead to me. It's starting to seem just really mechanical and dead. And I want more out of life because my life's going to end one of these days. And I felt like at 33, I was wasting my life because there had to be more than science. And and you and it, it it is different when you decide to believe when you grant assent to the truths of faith you say I give myself permission to believe that and it was like a scientific method for me because I don't do anything without testing it my husband can tell you that I don't even use a new laundry detergent until I've figured it out but I said I did it very scientifically. I'm like, I'm going to grant assent to these truths of faith and I'm going to test them out in the laboratory of my life. I'm going to go to mass because I'm obligated to. I'm going to accept that. I'm going to go to CCD. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to pray the rosary. I felt stupid the first time I did prayed the rosary walking around doing that. But I tried it out. It's like when you're a scientist. If you don't do if you don't make observations and do tests, you never know the conclusion. And over time, I think because I opened my heart to God, um, I started to change. And let me tell you what, Anita, I started to see things in a bigger light. I started to understand why we love science. I started to understand, you know, why should I care about atoms and molecules and where did they come from? And to me, it all fit together. It was like I had this bigger view of reality. I had science and I had my faith. And I started to love my children and I started to focus my life on the things that are going to make me happy and get to heaven. And so my science fit into that very well, but it actually made me love science even more. Does that, does that address your question? Well, I'm a cradle Catholic. And I've been very um, Catholic at certain points in my life. And right now I'm agnostic. Uh, so in other words, I've actively practiced the tenets of the Catholic faith for years. Um, and I decided that I could not reconcile science. I can't understand how we are believing in something we can't see. Um, I well, can't understand. What about that, Dr. Human... Trisankos? Uh, what about believing in things that we can't see? I mean, in a certain way, in a chemist, you believe in all <laughs> kinds of things you can't see. I have never seen an atom. <laughs> I've never seen an individual atom, and I based my career on it for a long time. Um, but you know, I, I always come back. I know what you. I know what you mean, Anita. I know. I know. It can be. It can be dark sometimes. Like I. Like why? Um, and, and I, I just, all I can say to that is that, you know, you have to let God work on your heart. But my, my son prays, bless us, O Lord, and these thy atoms. And I think that's the right way to look at science. Thank you, Dr. Stacy Trasankos is our guest this hour. Does science need Christ? Is that question a little provocative to you? Well, maybe, yeah. maybe we're happy if it's provocative, and we are very happy to take your call. 888-318-7884 is the number. 888-318. 318-7884. I'm Cy Kellett. This is Catholic Answers Live. We'll be right back. 
Hello, this is Archbishop Alexander Sample of the Archdiocese of Portland in Oregon. Keep that dial right here on Catholic Answers Live. We as Catholics need to stand strong, to be prepared to mount a daily defense, to respond to the many challenges that we as believers are presented with every day. Jimmy Aiken is here to help. His innovative new book, A Daily Defense, takes up a different challenge for every day of the year, 366 in all, teaching you how you can defend the faith and give answers to Catholics and skeptics alike. And it's user-friendly, with challenges and answers indexed alphabetically, so finding the answers can be quick and easy. Order your copy of A Daily Defense today by calling 1-888-291-8000, visiting catholic.com, or asking for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Want to tell others about your Catholic faith, but don't know where to start? Afraid you're not smart enough, knowledgeable enough, outgoing enough? Don't worry, says Catholic Answers apologist Trent Horn. With a few simple tips and a little practice, anyone can be an effective apostle and evangelist. In his new DVD, The Three Secrets to Sharing the Faith, Horn draws on years of experience to identify for you the most important steps to initiating such discussions and making them fruitful. Produced in a new and engaging documentary format, The Three Secrets to Sharing the Faith will give you hard facts, demonstrations, and real-life encounters to help you become a more fluent champion of God's church and His truth. You don't need to be tongue-tied anymore. Order your copy of The Three Secrets to Sharing the Faith today by calling one 291 8000 visiting catholic.com or asking for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Dr. Stacy Trasenkos is our guest this hour, author of a couple books you should have. You should have these books. Uh, one is Particles of Faith, and the other, well, you, you know what, Dr. Trusenkos, I'm looking at my notes here and I can't find it. Tell me the, name, the other one that I've forgotten, the one about Father Jackie. Oh, Science Was Born of Christianity, the teaching of Father Stanley Yaki. It's right here. And uh, was he, I, I don't know where he was from. Was he, he wasn't, uh, was he from the United States? No, he was from Hungary. He was, a, he was um, a priest of the Benedictine Order and a distinguished professor at Seton Hall University. Um, but he was from Hungary. But then he lived, he was, I don't remember exactly how long he was in the United States, but for decades. And um, he was a Templeton Prize winner in 1987, um, honorary member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, appointed by Pope St. John Paul II. So, and, um, and do you think very his, accomplished. His, his understanding of science and the relationship of science to Christianity, particularly this idea that modern science, the way we have it now, I think he used the term, what is he, precise science? Exact that, science. Exact yeah. science, yeah. The way, we have, the way we have it now uh, uh, is directly um, kind of a child of the Christian faith and of the, the presence of Christ in the world has made that possible. Um, that, do you think that his ideas in that regard are becoming more widely known and accepted? Yes, I think they are. I, I think um, part of the work I wanted to do was communicate what he meant, because it's real easy if you just say that claim to somebody that science was born of Christianity. It sounds triumphant. It sounds arrogant. Um, it sounds really poorly thought out. Um, so I wanted people to understand basically what he was saying, because there's a lot to the birth word. Like he acknowledges that there were contributions for other, from other cultures, but he also says there were still births of science in those cultures. Like it never made the jump to a viable discipline. Um, yeah. And that's a significant point. Well, the, the whole creation of disciplines is a creation of medieval Catholic universities. Yes. Yeah. Um, 888-318-7884 is the number. Before we go back to calls, I just have a question that's uh, urgent to me and I would like to get uh, to you. We were talking a little bit at the break about the... Um, Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, CARA, did some research that came out about a year yeah. ago about Catholic middle schoolers and high schoolers, but uh, the part that really bothers me, I, I have to say, is the middle schoolers losing their faith in large part because of the way science is being taught to them. Do I have that about right, and do you have any response to that? 
Yeah, it's, I don't really understand it because, I mean, I, I don't think it's really science. I think people a lot of times say science is the reason I'm losing my faith, but I think that's just a cover up because it's something else. Because uh, a lot of people who say that don't even know what they're talking about. They don't know what science, they don't, they couldn't tell you much about science anyway. But, um, but the one thing I do with all my classes, because I teach these online homeschool classes to high school students, and I teach my own kids, I'm like, it's really simple, guys. You have to look at everything, just like when you sit down at the table and you bless your meal and you say, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, and you thank God for everything that's in front of you. That meal is science. That's science. And you just have, if you just teach kids to do that, when you go to study your chemistry and when you go to crack your pencils and break them apart because you can't do stoichiometry or angular momentum equations or something in physics, what you are doing is studying the handiwork of God. You are studying the amazing, crazy, intricate details of how God created the physical world. And when you just approach it that way and you understand that scientists are never going to know everything and sometimes scientists say things that are stupid and you just got to learn to um, ignore that. But but when you fundamentally approach science that way that you're you're getting to know God better, there's no problem then. You, you're, you're okay. You're inoculated from the confusions of the culture. And I pray and hope every day that my students and my children, that they really are protected from that kind of confusion, that they know how to say, no, that's the wrong outlook. I've got the right outlook and I'm confident about it. We'll go back to calls then. Uh, Claudia in Albuquerque, New Mexico, listening on Immaculate Heart Radio. You are on with Dr. Stacy Trasankos. Your question, please. Oh, hello. Thank you, um, both of you. Uh, my question is, Maybe coming the opposite way, um, I'm born, born and raised Catholic, um, became a scientist, I am a research scientist, never had a conflict between the two, and to the contrary, I was really shocked when I, I met people in person <laughs> that, um, you know, with a, say, a more liberalist a literalist interpretation of the Bible, but college educated that, you know, thought that science could not be, um, Reconciled. <laughs> science and religion could not coexist. Yep. And I was wondering um, what, what has been, if, if you've had this experience of speaking to people in that direction, people that uh, have a very strong faith in God, very strong faith as Christians, and and sometimes this can be Catholics too that don't that may not understand that there isn't a, a conflict between the Catholic faith and science. But um, what is a good way to approach um, people that way? Would your two books be good for someone like that? Or uh, Claudia, let's let um, let's let Dr. Tresenko uh, tackle that. Okay. Yeah. I, if I understood you right, you're saying, what, what do you say to someone who is a practicing Catholic or a faithful person and a practicing scientist, and they think there is a conflict? They themselves have a perception of a conflict. Um, what what I, and there are a lot of people like that. You're right. What I, 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 what I say to those people, well, sometimes I just ignore them, but what I say to them too is like, those people sometimes strike me as not confident in their faith. They seem like they really, really need science to prove their faith for them. And it's not supposed to be like that. We're not supposed to use science to prove our faith. It's like using the mashed potatoes to prove mom exists. We are supposed to start with our faith and then look at science and say, thank you, God, for science. And so it's just the wrong way. And what you'll see a lot of those people do, like in the intelligent design community and among young earth creationists, they put themselves in the position of going out there and saying, nature did this, but God did a miracle here. Nature did this, God did a miracle there. It's kind of like a God of the gaps. Um, in a way. And it's a really dangerous theological position to put yourself in to start saying, you know, when God made miracles and when he didn't, just because you're trying to fit your science with your faith. It's wrong to do that. Um, and so I would, you know, if when I get a chance to sit down and talk with people like that, because it takes time, those are the kind of questions I put to them. It's like, who are you to go back and say that you know dogmatic as if it were dogma when when god worked miracles over the evolution of all time like it's we're not we're supposed to be humbler than that we're supposed to say this is what we know about science this is what i pray in the creed and believe in faith and then understand you're not going to know everything in your life 
Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. Um, uh, uh, Stacy, we have uh, viewers on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, and Periscope. Sometimes they type in a question. I'd like to just read one to you, if I could, from Emmanuel, uh, watching on YouTube Live. He wants to know how you would respond to Sam Harris's claim, and Sam Harris is uh, a, a yeah. well-known um, uh, new atheist. Sam Harris's claim that objective moral truths can be derived from science, that is, God is not needed for there to be objective moral truth. Yeah, I've never understood what he's, he meant there. I mean, I, I got lost with him when he said free will is an illusion. And I know there's a lot to that claim. And I've sorted through it. I've read those books. But when you put your finger on the fundamental part of it, he's denying there's anything spiritual. He's denying there's a soul to the human. And if you deny there's a soul to the human, then you deny there's God. And then you deny and you have nowhere to look for moral truth except for science. So if we're going to start there, I would make him admit that and I think he does that, um, that he has nowhere to look but science so of course he's going to conclude there's everything ends and begins with science because that's all he's got um, and but then you know it, it, it actually becomes very subjective when he starts saying this is the objective truth this is the objective truth there's a subjectivity in that there's nothing to base it on and anytime you have something logically derived you have to start with your starting assumptions so you know if he's going to build his logical system on that I would get down to the first logical premise and say just know that you were starting from a premise that says that you have no soul I have no soul you have no explanation for your intelligence and free will and we do so while you're sitting there scratching your head trying to figure out whether you can think freely or not we're going to go on with our lives and practice virtue and um and, and move on because I, I do think that the christian logic is a much much fuller logic um and that's what i would say to him i'm not sure what he would say back to that but uh, okay uh, you know, I, I, when you say that about free will i always wonder about the person who argues against free will but in favor of science <laughs> Because science is a matter of being convinced of things. It's saying we, the evidence has convinced me, and being convinced means making a decision. You have to decide, yes, the evidence is sufficient or it's not. So if you say there's no free will, aren't you saying that there's actually no science? Because I, I'm not actually being convinced by the evidence. Something else is happening. A chemical reaction is happening in my brain, but I have not decided, yes, the evidence is sufficient in one area or another. Yes, it, it doesn't. And many, many, many people have pointed this out. And personally, I just could, I could not accept that. I mean, you, you basically say you have no free, free will to think freely, that you're thinking freely that you think that. I mean, it just goes in circles <laughs> and it's nonsense. 888-318-7884 is the number. We've got one more segment with Dr. Stacy Trisk... Uh, excuse me. I, you know I have trouble with your name sometimes, <laughs> and I apologize for that. Trisankos. And uh, we will, we'll be right back here on Catholic Cancers Live. You're listening to Catholic Answers Live. We have a big problem. Our culture is dying and souls are in danger of being lost. The answer is conversion to Jesus Christ in His church. St. Paul Street Evangelization is a Catholic organization and we have hundreds of teams spreading the good news throughout the country. But we need your help. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Find out more and get involved today at StreetEvangelization.com. That's StreetEvangelization.com. Who or what is God? Does the universe provide clues to God's existence? Why would a loving, all-powerful God permit suffering in the world? In 20 Answers God, you'll find smart, solid answers to these questions and many more, all while it guides you down a path of rational inquiry and understanding towards an encounter with the central mystery of the universe. 20 Answers God is part of the 20 Answers series from Catholic Answers, offering hard facts, powerful arguments, and clear explanations of the most important topics facing the church and the world, all in a compact, easy-to-read package. Visit shop.catholic.com today and take a look at this exciting new series from Catholic Answers Press. The Catholic Answers Minute. I'm Father Vincent Serpa. In Mark 8:34, Jesus summoned the crowd and his disciples and said, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. Where do we hear anything about taking up our crosses but in the Catholic Church? This is not a passage that a lot of people like to dwell on. 
Many prefer those passages that speak of simply proclaiming one's faith in the person of Jesus, and that's that. They're saved. So we do the sinning, he does the suffering, and we go scot-free. Uh-uh. Those who've been closest to him have suffered the most. All his apostles were martyred except John, who stood at the foot of the cross with his mother, the most painful of places for those who loved him. What about you? You prefer an easy way out? Or do you think that his sacrificial love for you deserves a love that is more than just words? I'm Father Vincent Serpa for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. Call now with your question, 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. Dr. Stacy Trasenkos is our guest this hour on Catholic Answers Live. We're talking science and Christ. Does science need Christ? And we, we have a, a caller, uh, Dr. Trasenkos, who is, turns out to be one of your students from Colby Academy. Uh, Melanie, we have Melanie on line three. Melanie, you are on uh, Catholic Answers Live. Hello. Hi, thanks for being with us. Uh, Melanie, before you ask a question, I don't know if you have one, but I have a question for you. May I ask you a question? Yes, you can. Um, okay, so you study chemistry, is that right, with Dr. Trasenkos? Yes. And uh, for your study of chemistry, uh, does this, the fact that it comes within the context of the belief that chemistry is God's work, okay, so God made the chemicals, God made the physics, God made it all, <laughs> does that help you as a student? Yes, it does. I feel like whenever I'm reading my chemistry book, like everything fits together so well. So I'm like, God created all of this. It, it really helps me with my faith and my science studies. Do you kind of understand maybe people your age who don't have someone like Dr. Drasenkos for a teacher who maybe lose their faith or, get, or start questioning their faith because of the way science has taught them? I really don't know any of those people, but... I feel like if I ever encounter them, I feel like I could talk to them about it pretty easily with my science studies and faith and having Dr. Trisankos as a teacher. And now, Melanie, uh, the most important question, how are you doing in Dr. Trisankos' class? Are you going to pass? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Do you, uh, do you have any questions that, or anything that you'd like to share? Uh, you are on with uh, Catholic Answers Live and your teacher, Dr. Stacy Trisankos. Anything else? Um, I'm good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for calling us. Um, is that, Do Dr. Trisenkos, is that your experience, that students find it easier to make sense of science when they know that God's behind it? I, I hope they do. I, I mean, I really, I, I, as a teacher, like, I, I don't know what's, what they're thinking, but as a teacher, so many times in class, the, the light bulbs will go off, and they're amazed and awed and wowed because it's like, they had no idea God made the water molecule like with a <clears throat> perfect 104.5 degree angle. And that has a lot of to do with why there's life on earth, including their own bodies. And it's really fun telling students that and seeing the light bulbs go off. And I used to teach high school chemistry when I wasn't a person of faith back in the 90s. And that was one of the hardest questions. Students say, why do I have to care about chemistry? Well, you don't really have anything to tell them if there's no faith. And so I love teaching these students like this. Like I love showing them this atomic molecular world. And it's filled with awe and wonder. It's so fun to teach them that. Is there any kind of professional association or anything for uh, Catholic teachers of science to help them to do that? There is. Um, things like this are getting started. I am going to start this summer. There's a McGrath Institute for Church Life. It received a $1.6 million John Templeton Foundation grant to train high school teachers to raise the quality of high school science and religion education, to put to frame science into the broader context of Catholic theology. And it's gonna be a three year long training. I'm gonna go down with Dr. Stephen Barr and Dr. Um, Christopher Baglow and a lot of other people. We're going to meet at the Notre Dame Seminary this summer and we're gonna train 60 to 90 high school teachers that have been invited there to talk about this stuff. We're gonna do hands-on labs and show them how when you're just doing things like flame tests, how to talk about that in the context of God did this in, in the context of faith and to, to raise that quality of education. That is some cool stuff. Uh, Dr. Stephen Barr has also written quite extensively on the relationship between science and faith. He's very, very yeah. helpful. We'll go now to Donna in Whittier, California, listening on Immaculate Heart Radio. Donna, you are on with Dr. Stacy Trasenkos. 
Hello, and thank you. Uh, Dr. Kosankos, it uh, was lovely to hear your student and what she, <laughs> what she has come to already. She sounds like she's not very old, so it's all the, all the more lovely that she understands so much and can speak it. Um, yes. I have not read your books, so that I don't know if I heard one of the references to one of the titles, uh, and correct me please if I'm wrong, Science Begins with Christianity. Was that what somebody said at the beginning of the program? Science was born of Christianity. Was born, was born of Christianity, all right. Um, uh, I would like to just uh, both ask and comment, if I may. Um, I have a doctorate in philosophy and from Catholic University, and I'm wondering where you would locate the methodology of the scientific methodology of Aristotle, which goes right through, and of course pre, pre, mm -hmm. predates Christianity, goes right through right. the Christian thing and uh, with Thomas uses and so on. So my, my understanding uh, and what I'd like you to comment on is that Christianity absolutely is the sort of the final cause re re revelation, uh, but that science itself began long before Christianity. Mm -hmm. Galileo uses his methodology of Aristotle. Yeah. So and, if you could just come, and I'm sure you yes. can put the pieces together. Yeah, that, that's one of the things. Father Yaki, um, and, and, and I quote his research because that's what I'm familiar with, but he gives, full, just like St. Thomas Aquinas does, St. Thomas Aquinas, you know how he took, he and the other scholars, took the Greek works and they sorted through them and they rejected what directly contradicted the Christian faith, like that there is an eternally cycling world. St. Thomas Aquinas was adamant about that. He picked that out of all of Aristotle's teaching, but then he kept the rest of it. And so it, he corrected it, he purified it. And that is, so So you do have to see, you're, I agree with you, There, you do have to acknowledge there were Greek contributions that science couldn't have been born without the contributions from the Greek culture, it could not have been. But what the medieval Christian scholars did was they took those Greek, that Greek scientific corpus and they purified it from the errors that contradicted the Catholic faith. They rejected anything that, that said that we have to believe there's an eternally cycling cosmos and that there wasn't a beginning in time. Those two particular things were rejected on the basis of not observation or scientific experiment, but on the basis strictly of faith. But that doesn't mean the rest of it, that, you know, the Aristotelian natural philosophy couldn't be included and brought in. So yes, that is part of it. It's the beginning of science because that's why there's science in the West. There's technology in all the other cultures, but they did yep. not have science, they had technology. And yep. the methodology of science is I think what was so crucial and goes right through. So the, the only error would be that worldview, but that was how Aristotle was placing. That just mm -hmm. came as a, his final cause was simply that there was something beyond the material. Yep. So, okay, because uh, I think that would be misleading for people. I, I've yeah. found with my students and so on that the biggest lack in our culture, and I'm sure from listening to your student and you, uh, you know, it would be agreed, is that they take modern science like a point of view from yeah. the Enlightenment, which totally rejects any possibility yeah. of anything else. So they're left mm -hmm. with empiricism. Uh, only, and that can't really explain itself. I'm starting to yep. I'm starting to feel overwhelmed between two PhDs. I don't know how to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I you. agree with everything she's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you can explain it to me sometime. But <laughs> no, it's <laughs> very, very helpful. Um, I wonder, do I, Nick's looking at me. Do we have a, a call from another of Dr. Trisenko's students? Or uh, okay, so uh, why don't you? Uh, is that Stephen? Uh, Stephen. That's me. Oh, you're another of uh, Dr. You guys call her Dr. T, right? You don't try to. Dr. T, that's right. Okay. And uh, your experience of learning science, maybe you could just share with us real quickly your experience of learning science in this way, in a way that is what we might call more holistic, that is in the context of God's the creator and the material world is endlessly fascinating and worth studying. What's your experience there, Stephen? I would say, first of all, that science, instead of promoting a good man's ego and how much we understand about the world, is actually very humbling in that the Creator created all of the universe, you know, everything that we know about, everything that we don't know about in an instant, and sought up all the physical rules and everything in an instant. And we are still here. 
so many thousands of years later, we're still trying to figure it out and we still don't understand. And also through studying science, through the light of faith, we can see how ordered the mind of God is. Because the universe is his creation, we can see into the mind of God in a certain sense and how ordered it is and how thing, you know, rules obey other rules and just how ordered everything is. That's what I would say, first of all. I, I, well, I have to say something to you, Stephen, because I can see this. Your teacher is very proud of you. <laughs> She's very proud of you <laughs> being able to communicate. Is that, am I right, Dr. Trisankos? Yeah, it's just like, amen. I mean, hearing these hearing these students talk like that it's like that it's they get it it's it's not complicated you know it's it's humbling and it's okay and that makes it better and i just wish everybody it's a joyful thing isn't it Stephen? i wish everybody knew that yeah. like all the confusion it, it should be so joyful stoichiometry can be hard but <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i would agree with you there <laughs> 888-318-7884 is the number. Stephen, I will thank you for your call. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to try to get as many calls as we can in, Dr. Trisankos, before we finish this hour. Greg in Simi Valley, California, listening on Immaculate Art Radio. You are on with Dr. Stacy Trisankos. Hi. So this hour shocks me a little bit. As a 50-year-old man, I always assume science and religion were natural allies. Um, I think the beginnings of the empirical science yes. uh, uh, by a clergyman is, what if I remember schooling correctly, and so on and so forth. But um, I was just curious, what do you think of the theory that science ultimately allows us to see the hand of God? I know there's quite a few that make that claim, astrophysicists, cosmologists, et cetera. So what, what, are your, what's your, what do you think about that? I know you mentioned earlier you don't think science should be, uh, I don't know if it's mixed or prove God, but what do you think? Yeah. What do you say to the fact that it kind of indicates something, perhaps? Yeah, I like the word that um, Father Benedict Ashley and Dr. John Dealey used in their book, How Science Enriches Theology. I think it enriches your faith. Like, it's, like... Like to me, I think it would be sad to get to the end of your life and not know something about science, even if you're not a scientist, because that's something there to know about God. And so it's I guess it's it's proof in the sense of being inductive that it points to a God like like I asked when I wasn't faithful, like at some point I had to say, who did all of this? I needed that bigger answer. And so I do think it points to God and it's, it's evidence and proof in that way. But the most complicated cosmology or quantum physics or particle physics. Physics, it's all of the same kind of evidence as looking at a rainbow and going, wow, you know, thank you, God. It's all the same kind of evidence. So definitely, and, and it's like it, not knowing chemistry and physics and getting to the end of your life would be to me like not seeing a rainbow. You wouldn't know God did that. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Is, is it harder to see the rainbow, though, when, I mean, science in many ways is, a, is through instruments now. It's not through a direct contact with nature. Is it, is it harder because of that to, uh, to you know, to, to give glory to God or no? If you, when you do an experiment and it works the way your, your, your calculations predicted, yeah, you're like, holy cow, that worked. I just like it, you don't, it's very satisfying to see the experimental results be what you predicted. Particles of Faith, A Catholic Guide to Navigating Science is the latest book by Dr. Stacy Trasankos. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us here thank on Catholic you. Answers Live. Thank you. I'm thank gonna, you. I'm pretty much going to ask you a million more times to come on. I, it thank was, you. It was, I want to. Oh, good. It was fun. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Uh, thank you to all of our uh, listeners throughout the week. Thank you for those who joined us on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or Periscope. Jesus Christ is the light of the nations. Stay in that light, and we'll see you next week on Catholic Answers Live.